Okay, we left off in our class notes talking about Martin Luther, and we are using a PowerPoint to go through this section of the class notes. Oh, one thing I did want to just mention. Uh, in the last class, we were I was asked the question about whether or not there are still monks operating in the monastery at Erfurt, and... I was a little unsure about exactly what is going on there today, so I did a little bit more research on it. And I found out that there was a seminary that was there up until I think it was yeah, 1993. So a seminary occupied the restored buildings from 1960 until 1993. Uh, now it's a conference center, but the monastery is also home to some of the sisters of the Casteller Ring community, a Protestant religious order in the Benedictine tradition whose members take vows of poverty, obedience, and celibacy. So there are nuns of some sort who are still operating in the monastery there. So that's something I had never actually investigated before you guys asked that question. So uh, I wanted to come back, set the record straight. Uh, there's no monks, but there are some nuns living there in Erfurt, Germany, in that monastery. Uh, uh, I know about as much of them. Uh, I know about as much about them as is here in this paragraph. So, some Protestant re Protestant religious order. So it's not Catholic, but it goes back to the Benedictine tradition. Well, that is Catholic. So I don't know exactly how they work all that out, but that's uh, right. They're in a movement that was started by a guy who smuggled a nun out of the monastery and married her. It's true. <laughs> so, anyway, that's all I know. Um, yes, uh, it, right there, Protestant religious order in the Benedictine tradition, which is a Catholic order, so I don't know exactly how that works itself out, but there you go. All right, well, let's get back to uh, the history. When we get up to the present, I don't know anything about anything. I think that's probably obvious by now, but... We can talk about the 16th century. I do know a few things about that. So let's get back into Luther's life. You'll remember Luther was training to be a lawyer when he had kind of a life-changing experience. It wasn't his conversion, but it was a step in the process that God used to draw Luther to himself, where he was walking home, surrounded by lightning and thunder, thought he was going to die, cried out to his family's patron saint, St. Anne, help me and I will become a monk. And he did not die, he kept his promise, and in 1505 he entered the Augustinian monastery there in Erfurt, Germany. And then we talked about his discovery of the gospel of grace. And really what Brian Biedebach was talking about this morning in chapel fits so very, very well with Luther's own testimony. And uh, we even read some of this testimony last time where Luther had come across the phrase, the righteousness of God. In it, he did not see Christ's righteousness imputed to him initially, all he saw was God's standard of perfection, and therefore the righteousness of God stood against him as really a wall of condemnation, which it does against all unsaved sinners, because we are all under the wrath of God, we are all children of wrath, dead in our sin, and Luther himself recognized his deadness but thought for a time that he could work his way back to spiritual life and in the process only got more and more and more frustrated by the realization that nothing he did contributed anything to his holiness or his righteous standing, his justification before God. And when he discovered through the internal illuminating power of the Holy Spirit bringing life to the words of Scripture, when he discovered that the righteousness of God is not only that righteous standard, but also the righteous provision or the provision of Christ's righteousness imputed to the believer, whereby the sinner becomes righteous, not through his own works, but through that act of grace. He says, I, I felt as though I were born again. I was regenerated and as if the doors had been flung open and I came out. Almost like Lazarus, I came out of the tomb. 
and uh, recognize that the man who is righteous is righteous uh, because of God's merciful justification. And as he even says there, a totally other face of the entire Scripture at that point showed itself to me because for the first time he understood the Scriptures not only in terms of judgment and wrath and holiness and perfection, but he understood the Scriptures in terms of grace and mercy and kindness and compassion. All right, so uh, we're getting to the point here where we picked up or left off last time. Um, <clears throat> This is the castle church there in Wittenberg, which was used uh, by the university. It was also used as a church there in Wittenberg. And Luther, when he heard that Johann Tetzel was coming to town to sell indulgences, Luther reacted to the sale of indulgences the same way that Jan Hus had reacted and John Wycliffe had reacted in generations before him. He was incensed and indignant. And we talked about that already on Thursday, but you can put yourself in Luther's shoes. If there was a Pentecostal, faith-healing, televangelist, word of faith guy from TBN coming to do a praise-a-thon in your local church community, and there were people that you knew who were thinking about giving their life savings to this person as a seed faith because they think that it's going to bring them health, wealth, and happiness. And you had the opportunity to write a blog article of 95 reasons why this faith healer is a fraud. You might go to the web and do that. That's essentially what Luther does here. He recognizes that people under his own shepherding care are going to give their money to a false system and he cannot remain silent. Now, initially, his 95 theses are intended for inter-church debate, and he writes them in Latin. Christian History Magazine here talks about the fact that these were simply intended to invite fellow academics to what was called, quote, a disputation on the power and eff efficacy or effectiveness of indulgences, which was the official title of these 95 Theses. So it's published in Latin. Uh, it's likely that he posted them on October 31st. That's generally the traditional date that's given for the posting of the 95 Theses. We don't know for sure, but if it was October 31st, that would have been significant because it was the day before All Saints Day, and there would have been larger numbers of people there in the church going past the door, seeing the 95 Theses there, even if many of the common people could not read Latin. But the Theses were taken down. It's a little bit mysterious exactly how it all happened, but somebody translated them into German. They were then sent to the printing press, and soon, within just a matter of weeks, everyone in Germany had a copy of this scandalous ar article that called the Pope's authority into question, certainly called into question the wisdom of selling these certificates of indulgence that weren't worth the paper they were printed on. One of the things that I think is kind of interesting as we reverse here just a tiny bit, here's a woodcut showing Tetzel selling those indulgences. Here we have a picture of Albert of Hohenzollern, who was the cardinal who authorized the sale of indulgences in that part of the Holy Roman Empire, and then Tetzel himself, the man who went around and sold them. And uh, he had a very, uh, a very effective but very cheesy slogan, which in English we translate as a coin, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And students have asked me in the past, does that really rhyme in German or is it just a cheesy Americanism to anglicize it in that way? And the answer is no, it, it actually does rhyme in the German. So when a coin in the coffer clings, clinked, uh, the soul towards heaven springs is the actual German, but the idea is the same, that you get out of purgatory faster if uh, you give money for these indulgences or, or your relatives or whoever. So, um, yeah, the, uh, the fraudulent counterfeit uh, forms of religion for the sake of making money have been around for a long time, going all the way back even to the Reformation and certainly before that as well.
These uh, indulgences raised money. Uh, Albert of Hohenzollern would get a cut. Johann Tetzel would get a small cut for his uh, part of actually going and doing the sales. And then a large portion of the money would go to the Pope, and it was used for the building of those great architectural wonders in Vatican City, particularly at this time St. Peter's Basilica was being built. So the very indulgences that Luther was condemning were being used to raise funds to pay for St. Peter's Basilica and uh, perhaps even to fund Michelangelo as he painted really nice paintings on the ceiling of the chapel. Here's a artist's rendering of Luther nailing his 95 theses to the castle church door. I don't know if it was quite this dramatic. You can see Luther there and Melanchthon is standing across from him in the, in the big black hat. I'm not sure who that other individual is there, but this kind of dramatizes it. And there may have been a little bit of drama, but I think sometimes we can over-dramatize things as we remember them in history. There tends to be a little bit of a romantic aspect to all of this. Um, it could have been something as simple as Luther just writing this article for interchurch debate and putting it in a public place, as all such articles would have been posted. So this was not an act of vandalism. This was more putting something on the community message board for everybody to see. And uh, there I am with uh, Dan Dumas, who's a former, uh, former pastor here at Grace Church and now works at Southern Seminary in Louisville. But we took a trip to visit some of these Reformation sites. The original doors, those are some iron doors there. The original doors were made of wood, where he nailed the 95 Theses into them. They burned in a fire, and so... Subsequent to that, they put up these iron doors, and the iron doors actually have the 95 theses embossed on them. So the 95 theses are there on those doors permanently. Uh, they are actually embossed into the iron. And then above the doors, we have Luther and Melanchthon, who was kind of his sidekick. <laughs> and we'll talk more about Melanchthon later, a fellow scholar and theologian there in Wittenberg and they are worshiping uh, Christ crucified. Okay, let's, let's read just a little bit from the 95 Theses. I think it's important for us to interact a little bit with some of these documents. It would not do justice to a church history class if we never actually interacted with any of the real history and we just talked about it all the time. So let's read a little bit about this. Um, as we do, I think it's important to note a couple things. Number one, the 95 Theses specifically was written against indulgences. So it is not this bold charter of Protestant doctrine. It does not go through the five solas of the Reformation or anything like that. It is specifically aimed at Johann Tetzel coming to town to sell these pieces of paper for people's hard-earned money under the false pretense of getting them out of purgatory faster. Uh, Zwingli will write a, a 67 disputations, which we'll talk about later, which actually are more of a charter of Protestant doctrine than the 95 Theses are. But the 95 Theses, the, the response, really the firestorm of response that they created, was the catalyst that God used to introduce the, the climax of Reformation, or what we call just the Reformation proper, of the 16th century, and so that's why they are so significant. Secondly, I think it's helpful for us to realize that Luther is still in a little bit of transition at this point. He's just been saved in 1515. He doesn't fully understand all the implications of the things that he's learning in terms of his relationship with the Pope and the Catholic Church at this point. So sometimes people read the 95 Theses and they say, well, he's still saying things in here that are kind of you know, deferential towards the Pope. Well, that's because he hasn't officially broken with the papal system yet. That's going to take place really in 1519. The official uh, break takes place in January 3rd of 1521 when uh, he is excommunicated by Pope Leo X. Okay, so with those things in mind, let's read just a few of the 95 theses. And don't worry, we will not be reading all 95. But number one, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says, repent, repent, 
He means that the entire life of the faithful should be a repentance. This statement cannot be understood of the sacrament of penance, i.e. of confession and satisfaction, which is administered by the priesthood. In other words, command to repent is a change in your entire life. Penance is something you do when you mess up to make up for the fact that you messed up and you can live essentially however you want as long as you go to the priest and confess and do acts of penance. So he is attacking now the penitential system. And of course, indulgences is based on that because penance are the things you do in this life. Purgatory is the penance you do in eternity. And so indulgences are a way to reduce penance. Number 27, they preach human folly who pretend that as soon as money in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So here he's going right after Tetzel. He was familiar with Tetzel's cheesy slogan, his marketing scheme, and he went right after it. Number 32, those who suppose that on account of their letters of indulgence, they are sure of salvation, will be eternally damned along with their teachers. That's pretty straightforward. So even in transition, he's still hitting... Some nerves, I'm sure. Um, but his point is, look, if you're trusting on this to get you to heaven, rather than on the work of Christ to get you to heaven, then you are lost. Number 36, every Christian who truly repents has full forgiveness, both of punishment and guilt bestowed on him, even without letters of indulgence. So if you have truly come to saving faith, then you are saved whether or not you have something from the Pope that is a get-out-of-purgatory-free card. Number 37, every true Christian, whether living or dead, has a share in all the benefits of Christ and the church, for God has granted him these even without letters of indulgence. 45, Christians should be taught that whoever sees a person in need and instead of helping that person uses his money for an indulgence, obtains not an indulgence of the Pope, but the displeasure of God. So if you're walking to see Tetzel to give him your lunch money for this piece of paper that says your relatives are going to get out of purgatory earlier, and you walk by somebody who's starving on the street begging for bread, you obtain not an indulgence from God, but actually his wrath and displeasure. Pretty pointed. Here's a great one, number 51. Christians should be taught that the Pope ought and would Give his own substance to the poor, from whom certain preachers of indulgences extract money, even if he had to sell St. Peter's in order to do it. So, you can see why Leo X, who's the Pope at this time, and why some of the other Catholic hierarchy are going to be pretty upset when this gets translated into German, and suddenly everybody in Germany is reading this, and the the sale of indulgences largely comes to a a standstill. Number 81, this shameless preaching of pardons makes it hard even for learned men to defend the Pope's honor against slander or to answer the indubitably shrewd questions of the laity. So they ask us these great questions, we're unable to answer them. Well, what kind of questions? Number two, 82. For example, here's a good question. Why doesn't the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love? For after all, he he does release countless souls for the sake of sordid money contributed for the building of a cathedral. In other words, if this treasury of merit has an infinite amount of merit and the Pope has the ability to dispense as much of it as he wants to whomever he wants, why doesn't he just give all of it to everybody rather than using it to make money in order to build a fancy church? Number 90, because Luther knows how the Catholic Church historically responds to these kinds of things. To suppress these very telling arguments of the laity by force, instead of answering them with adequate reasons, would be to expose the church and the Pope to the ridicule of their enemies and to render Christians unhappy. So if you just try and kill me or put me in jail to shut me up, you're just proving my point. Number 94, we should admonish Christians to follow Christ, their head. Here we have that theme, Christ, the head of the church, through punishment, death, and hell. And so let them set their trust on entering heaven heaven through many tribulations rather than some false security and peace. 
And interestingly, as we note there at the bottom, Tetzel actually wrote his own theses, so he wrote a blog article back against Luther. He wrote his own theses where he essentially said, don't listen to some monk from Germany, you need to listen to and obey the authority of the Pope. So again, it really is the authority of Christ and his word over against the authority of the Pope and some of these corrupt practices like the sale of indulgences. Was it believed that the Pope had the authority to release people from purgatory regardless if money was given? Yeah, oh yeah, indulgences can be get, indulgences don't have to be bought. They can also be given for free. And in fact, the Catholic Church today still, the Pope still grants indulgences, but they no longer use them as a fundraising technique. Uh, Because after the Reformation, the Catholic Church goes through what's called the Counter-Reformation and kind of cleans up its act and uh, recognized that they needed to change some superficial aspects of their operation in order to avoid the bad publicity and attacks of of the Protestants. So there is still an indulgence system, and those indulgences are given for certain uh, actions and uh, in some, to some degree, it overlaps uh, acts of penance, and then to others, uh, it seems to be kind of above and beyond uh, spiritual activities that are then granted some level of, of forgiveness, temporal forgiveness. Yep, Jared. Did they ever try to reply to any of those other than saying, just listen to the Pope? Oh yeah, the 95 Theses created a, a firestorm, and, and Leo X was, he was, at that particular time in 1517, he was distracted with some other um, political affairs that were going on in Italy and, and in the southern parts of Europe at that time, and I think he also thought that this was something that was going to be handled in-house initially. So the initial wave of reaction comes from the Augustinian order itself, and they attempt to kind of um, put a lid on what Luther is saying, uh, but Luther ends up convincing many of them to become Protestants in the process. And then there is a debate that is held in 1519, and uh, really the most well-known Catholic debater at the time, a man named Johann Eck, or Johann von Eck, came and debated against Luther, And uh, it was really at that point, and by 1519, it had sort of moved from being about the indulgences themselves to being about the authority of the Pope. Does the Pope have the authority to do this sort of thing? And so the debates in 1519, July of 1519, center on papal authority. And and Eck um, is, is really pretty soundly defeated by Luther, who goes to the New Testament, and also to the church fathers and demonstrates that there is no one in the scriptures or in the early generations of church history who attributes any sort of authority to the bishop of Rome, certainly not anywhere to the degree of what the papacy had become by that point. Uh, Luther also looks to the Eastern Church and points out the obvious fact that there's a whole segment of Christendom that doesn't recognize papal authority at all. And Eck has no good answers for any of this. But the one thing that Eck is able to do is he's able to get Luther to acknowledge the fact that Luther appreciates, affirms, and agrees with the teachings of Jan Hus. And Eck actually leaves the debate thinking he won the debate, because he got Luther to admit his admiration for someone who had been condemned a, th- uh, a century, a hundred years earlier, as being a heretic. And so from the Catholic perspective, Luther's acknowledged that he's in line with a heretic. Ergo, Luther is a heretic. But from Luther's perspective, and from those who heard the debate, when it came down to actually using scripture and plain reason, as Luther will articulate later, Luther won the debate hands down. Martin Bootser, who becomes an important reformer um, in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, 
Martin Bootser was there at that debate, and it was, it was that debate which the Lord largely used to bring Bootser into the Protestant fold. So, yeah, the reaction is significant. It took a little bit of time. Part of the reason is because, as I mentioned, Leo X was a little bit distracted with some other things that were going on at that point, but also because the, the spread of information just occurred much more slowly at that time in, in history. So, you know, Luther writes this article, then it's translated, then it's printed, and then it's disseminated. But even that process, which was amazingly quick, uh, you know, took weeks and, and, and even months in some cases for people to fully get this information in their hands. And so f- for this, you know, the debate in 1519 was a little over a year and a half after he had nailed the 95 Theses. That's still moving pretty quick for 16th century Europe. It's not moving quick for us, where if this was posted on a blog two days later, if you haven't heard about it and responded, you're out of the loop. But, um, you know, there's advantage. I don't want to get off on a sidetrack. There are advantages to the quick dispensing of information. There are also some severe disadvantages. But in any case, 16th century Europe, information moved a lot slower. So in 1519, we have this debate with Eck on the topic of papal authority. And um, then in 1520, Leo X issues a papal bull, that would be a papal decree, ordering Luther to recant within 60 days or face excommunication. And you have to understand that to be excommunicated, look, there's only one church in Europe at this time, and it is the Catholic Church. So to be excommunicated from the Catholic Church means to be excommunicated from the Christian culture and society that permeates Western Western Europe at this time. So this is no small thing. Moreover, there is no separation between church and state. So to be excommunicated from the church also means to be put out really of the state and be considered an enemy of the state. To be excommunicated as a heretic is to put yourself in the position of being regarded as a traitor in the eyes of the state itself. So this is not a small thing for Luther to consider. Luther takes the full 60 days, and uh, really Luther understood because he understood how Huss had been treated and how Wycliffe had been treated with his bones exhumed and then burned in effigy, Luther understood that it was likely that he would be killed as a result of the stand that he was taking, and and in all likelihood would be burned at the stake. Savonarola had not been burned, but he had been hung, and then his body was burned, so there was generally flames involved in the punishment of heretics by the Roman Catholic Church. So Luther understands what it will mean to not only ignore, but actually reject this papal bull. And yet Luther takes the full 60 days to respond. And on that final day, uh, final day of his opportunity to respond, he marches out into the center of Wittenberg, brings some of his students with him, and he builds a bonfire and sets the papal bull on fire. So, this is his way of saying, I'm going to be burned at the stake, but before I do, I'm going, to burn, I'm going to burn this at the stake. So here's what I think of your condemnation. It, it can go to hell, because that's what burning at the stake was meant to symbolize. People who were burned at the stake were people who were going to spend their eternity condemned and experiencing divine wrath. P, uh, Luther also wrote, wrote a response where he called the Pope Antichrist, Uh, Again, kind of that general term from 1 John, there are many antichrists, the spirit of antichrist. So this was not an eschatological reference to the end of Revelation, but just a general reference to the fact that the Pope represented the greatest threat to the true church because he had usurped Christ's place as the head of the church. And so he called the Pope Antichrist who oversaw a church that was, quote, the most lawless den of robbers, the most shameless of all brothels, and the very kingdom of sin, death, and hell, unquote. So it, by this point now, in 1520, Luther has, the transition is complete. So if there was a little bit of 
uncertainty in his heart about his relationship with the Catholic Church in 1517, by 1520, there is no longer any doubt. Yeah? I was just wondering, this, um, the, the papal bull delivered by Eck, was that, I mean, is that a private thing? Would he have just gone to knock on Luther's door to well, hand it to him? Was that... Eck was not the one who delivered it. So there would have been, Eck was the one who debated with, uh, with Luther in 1519. And then as a, as a result of that debate where Luther was aligned with Huss and where, Luther, where it was obvious that Luther was not going to recant, then Leo X finally responded by issuing this papal bull. He would have sent some sort of official papal delegation to deliver it. Whether or not it was a public delivery, I, I don't entirely know. Or whether it was just like a summons to jury duty. I got one in the mail yesterday. So I'm, I'm feeling that, uh, that joy. I'm feeling that joy. And I have five days to respond. Luther had 60 days to respond. And if I don't respond, I will get in trouble. And Luther knew that if he didn't respond, he would also get in trouble. Um, yeah, no, I will, not be, I will not be burning anything anytime soon. <clears throat> so here is the papal bull. Uh, obviously, this is a um, a copy of what this would have looked like. A student asked me a few years ago, "Wait a second, didn't they burn his?" Well, yeah. So how do they have it? Um, no, this is a, a a replica of what a papal bull like like the one issued against Luther would have looked like. Luther burned his, and you have the woodcut there of the students and servants in Wittenberg helping to stoke the fire as Luther burns not only the papal bull, but other Catholic documents. Okay, it, uh, it was during this time then that Luther began to understand what he would come to call the theology of the cross, which he contrasted with the theology of glory. Uh, those terms are not terms that we often use, but the concepts will become immediately familiar to you. The theology of the cross taught that human beings can do nothing to earn their own righteousness before God, nor can they add anything to the righteousness provided for them through the cross. Any righteousness given to them comes from outside of them. Luther called this an alien righteousness, which is to say that it comes from a source other than us, outside of us. It is Christ's righteousness, which is then imputed to us. The theology of glory, on the other hand, taught that even after the fall, there remained some ability in man to achieve his own righteousness. So it was this synergistic idea that through man's free will, sinners are saved by materially cooperating with the righteousness they receive from God. Thus it is God's righteousness plus their own righteousness that ultimately gets them into heaven. And that is still the Roman Catholic view. And that was what Luther was reacting against. Luther, of course, understood his view to be diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive to the standard Roman Catholic position. Luther was excommunicated by Pope Leo X on January the 3rd, 1521. And when Leo X recognized that he was not able to silence Luther through ecclesiastical means. He appealed to the political authority. At that time, uh, this part of Germany was under the rule of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire consisted of a number of regions, and these regions had princes who ruled over them. And then over these princes, there was an emperor. And that emperor at this time was a very young man, just in his 20s, named Charles V. He'll become important a little bit later when we talk about the English Reformation. Uh, Charles V uh, was the emperor. But uh, the prince who was over the particular part of Saxony where Luther lived in Wittenberg was a man named Frederick, Frederick the Wise. He was older and well-established. He was actually one of the most powerful princes in all of the Holy Roman Empire. He was one of the electors who helped to select the emperor and uh, was, was very, very powerful. And so he held a lot of sway. This is important because he becomes the protector of Luther. Luther. 
If it wasn't for Frederick the Wise of Saxony, Luther would have undoubtedly been burned at the stake just as he suspected that he might be. But Frederick was able to convince Charles V to guarantee Luther a right of safe passage when Luther was called to Worms to appear before the emperor and his entourage. Now, remember, John Huss had been given a right of safe passage to go to Constance, and it hadn't done him any good. Uh, but So Luther wasn't entirely convinced that this right of safe passage was going to keep him safe either. But because of Frederick's standing, he actually was able to withhold the immediate death sentence that Charles V probably would have otherwise inflicted. So Luther is, in, is summoned to Worms. Uh, a diet, by the way, doesn't refer to anything you eat. I, I realize it's funny that it's a diet of worms. We can all be junior hires and laugh about that. But no, it's the diet of Worms. Uh, a diet refers to a council, an imperial council, rather than a church council. So this is where the emperor is present. It's not just the cardinals, the bishops, and even perhaps the Pope. So this is not a church council as much as it is an imperial council. Uh, he was told to recant. Um, and uh, on the morning before the trial began, here's uh, part of the prayer that he prayed. And uh, I think you'll appreciate some of the words here because of their significance. My God, stand by me against all the world's wisdom and reason. Not mine, but yours is the cause. I would prefer to have peaceful days and to be out of this turmoil. But yours, O Lord, is the cause. It is righteous and eternal. Stand by me, true eternal God. In no man do I trust. Stand by me, O God, in the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, who shall be my defense and shelter. Yes, my mighty fortress through the might of and strength of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And certainly Luther lived at a time where there were grand castles and cathedrals, mighty fortresses of stone. And if you ever visit that part of Europe, those buildings, those edifices are still standing and they are impressive. And Luther, having lectured through the Psalms at Wittenberg, certainly understood David's cry, similar cries, that God would be his mighty tower. And Luther appropriated that to his own life, even here as he stands on trial, really for his life. So it's April of 1521. By the time his trial takes place, he is told to recant. Luther asks for a day to think about how he is going to respond. It's not so much that he's doubting his stance it's more, I think, that he wants to be able to respond in a way that articulates clearly, exactly, and precisely what it is that he wants to die for, since that really is what is at stake. Uh, here we have, again, kind of a dramatic presentation of Luther's stand before Charles V at the Diet. Um, I don't know that Luther was quite that... Uh, demonstrative, uh, probably more sober than anything else. And even his famous, famous words were probably uttered not so much as a, not so much as an act of defiance in terms of their tone, but I think more of an act of sober solemnness as he recognized that the things that he was saying uh, were going to put a price on his head. Luther said these words in Latin, which was, of course, the official ecclesiastical language, and then he repeated these words in German so that everyone who was there could hear what was said. And according to some reports, there were even some um, affirmation, cheers and applause that came from certain parts of the court that were listening to him as he took this great stand. But anyway, famous words here, since your majesty and your worships desire a simple reply, I will answer. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. 
My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. And then he probably said, here I stand, I can do no other. But there's a little bit of question about whether or not he actually said, probably the most famous words in the whole speech, here I stand. Uh, Ronald Bainton, in his a well-known biography of Martin Luther, makes the case that, that those words were an authentic part of what he said. But in any case... Certainly a bold, bold stand where he puts, really stakes his life and his soul on the authority of Scripture over and against the authority of the Pope and now even the authority of the most powerful man in Europe at that time, Emperor Charles V, who had the biggest army and, um, <clears throat> and certainly could have extinguished Luther's life with nothing more than a word. Here is the plaque in Germany today, and you can see here I stand um, at the Diet of Worms there, Martin Luther 1521. The actual place where the meeting was held is no longer there, so it's just a park and a plaque. And I always tell my classes, there I stood. I could do, I could do no other. Um, Luther was declared a notorious heretic, which was code for a dead man. Uh, he was declared a notorious heretic by Emperor Charles V, who was furious at Luther, but honored his pledge to Frederick that he would grant Luther safe passage. But on May 25th, 1521, when he issued the Edict of Worms, Charles made it a crime for anyone in Germany to help Luther and allowed anyone who wanted to kill Luther without any sort of legal repercussions. It banned Luther's writings. It made him very much a wanted man. He became a hunted heretic. On the way back from the Diet of Forms, Luther was kidnapped. He was uh, actually kidnapped by people who were sympathetic to him by order of his protector, Frederick of Saxony, Frederick III. He was kidnapped because uh, Frederick was afraid that he was going to be put to death um, very, very quickly after the Diet of Worms was over. He was taken to a castle called the Wartburg Castle. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. He took on the name Squire George. In German, it's Junker Jorg. Looks like Junker George, but uh, Junker Jorg was his pseudonym just for his own safekeeping while he was being kept essentially in witness protection. And what did he do while he was here in the Wartburg Castle with nothing to do except translate the New Testament into German? And over the next few months, in a very short period of time, he translated the New Testament, from Greek, thanks to Erasmus, into the German language. And in much the same way that Tyndale's work becomes the basis for the King James, and the King James becomes a literary masterpiece that really shapes the English language and English culture, Luther's German translation similarly unifies the German language and uh, represents <coughs> uh, a masterpiece not only theologically but also linguistically. Uh, there is a story about him throwing an inkwell at the devil, and uh, if you ever read a biography of Luther, they may include that story where he was trying to do some translation. Maybe you felt this way while you were doing your Hebrew or Greek translations. He was trying to do some translation, and he felt as if the devil were personally in the room afflicting him and uh, inhibiting him from doing the work. And he got so mad that he threw an inkwell at the wall, um, supposedly throwing it at the devil. Um, obviously, the devil was not physically present, but it wouldn't surprise me because of Luther's dramatic uh, and demonstrative personality if he actually did. If you go visit that room today, uh, there are supposedly some spots on the wall that 
they're not really from that ink well, but some tour guides try and make it sound like they are. Anyway. Uh, while Luther was gone from Wittenberg, uh, there was one of his fellow professors at the university there, a man named Andreas Karlstadt, who began to make additional reforms in Wittenberg, uh, more radical reforms. There were also some really radical Anabaptists known as the uh, Zwickau prophets who came to town and uh, started creating all sorts of social upheaval. And when Luther gets back home, he's going to put an end to all of that. But that's going to connect us with our discussion on the Anabaptists when we talk about them later. There's the Vortberg Castle. And a beautiful castle. Uh, there's the, the chapel or the church inside the castle. There you go. There's the, the desk where Luther translated much of the, in the room where Luther translated much of the German New Testament. And a picture there on the wall of Luther at that time period. And um, still, a, still a young man. In fact, Luther was born in 1483, and we're now in 1521, 1522, so he's not even 30 years old at this point. And maybe that can encourage you men as young seminary students, many of you in your 20s, that God was using these reformers at a similar age. When Luther finally gets back to the to his hometown of Wittenberg. Uh, he expels these radical Anabaptists. And again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the Anabaptists in particular. Uh, Luther was, and maybe this is a good time to mention this, Luther was very concerned that his religious reformation not become a political revolution. And there were these more radical Anabaptists who wanted it to become a political revolution. And they wanted to use the Reformation as a catalyst for really upstaging the entire political system in Europe at that time. In fact, one of these radicals, a guy named Thomas Muntzer, preached a form of communism that actually earned him a statue in communist East Germany when East Germany was still under communist hands. So they looked all the way back to some of these guys as early communists. Luther wanted nothing to do with that. Luther wanted his reformation to be about the church and just the church. And even within the church itself, Luther wanted to move slowly with reform because he didn't want to upset the apple cart, so to speak, along the way. That's going to be different than Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin, who are going to be much more progressive or radical, I suppose we could say, in the reforms that they make. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Luther adopts a principle that's known as the, nomin uh, the normative, excuse me, the normative principle, whereas Zwingli and Calvin have a principle that is the, what's called the Reformation principle, uh, the, the reform principle, um, yes, or the regulative principle. Um, is In fact, it's more commonly called the regulative principle. The regulative principle says if the scripture, specifically the New Testament, doesn't command us to do something, then we're not going to do it. The normative principle says if the scripture doesn't prohibit us from doing something, then we are allowed to do it. So in Lutheran churches, there's a lot more liturgy, there's a lot more of the icons still present because it's a reformation that's taking place slowly. We're not going to just go in and clear out everything from the church and ban all sorts of things because unless they're explicitly prohibited in Scripture, we're going to allow them to continue. Calvin and Zwingli are not going to approach it the same way. In fact, Zwingli's going to go in and he's going to take all the statues and everything out and he's going to crush them to little bits. Because in his mind, if the New Testament doesn't specifically command it, then we're not allowed to do it. And we'll talk more about the regulative versus the normative principle. But if you're, you know, those discussions are still going on today. In fact, um, <laughs> I think I can say this without recommending the author. I don't recommend the author. But Mark Driscoll wrote a book, uh, the, not the Radical Reformation, but I think it was Confessions of a Reformation Rev. It was one of those two books. 
where he talks specifically about the normative principle of Luther versus the regulative principle of Calvin and how evangelical churches today are still talking through those issues. Where does that come from? It comes from this period of history. All right, Luther preaches a series of sermons called the Invocavit Sermons. And uh, those sermons are where he expels these radical reformers. Here's what he says. Uh, and, and again, I'm just giving you a little taste. I mean, Luther wrote over 60,000 pages of material in his lifetime. And so he was prolific. But here's just a little taste. Do you know what the devil thinks when he sees men use violence to propagate the gospel? In other words, people using religious reform as an excuse for political revolution, which involves, of course, violence. Do you know what Satan thinks about that? He sits with folded arms behind the fire of hell and says with malignant looks and a frightful grin, Ah, how wise these madmen are to play my game. Let them go on. I shall reap the benefit. I delight in it. But when he sees the word running and contending alone on the battlefield, then he shudders and shakes for fear. Luther's point is, stop trying to rebel by force. Let the word of God change society and change the church. Here is the Wittenberg Town Church. This is where Luther preached, and he preached multiple times a week to the citizens of Wittenberg. So he was a preacher, a professor, a writer, and a reformer. Uh, very, very productive in terms of his output. And it's still a Lutheran church today, and you can see the inside of the church there. I think somewhat typical of uh, some of the Lutheran churches in Europe today uh, characterized more by either liberalism or dead orthodoxy than true Reformation passion, but still there. All right, one of the very, very radical things that the Reformation introduced, and I've mentioned it in a class period before, was for the first time in several hundred years, since mandatory celibacy had been required of the priests in Western Europe, for the first time in several hundred years, we have the picture of a godly family, of a pastor's family, starting with Martin Luther and then Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin and the other reformers. They will all be married for the most part. Luther couldn't understand why celibacy could be mandatory when Paul, who of course... Um, extolled the virtues of celibacy, nonetheless wrote to Titus and to Timothy that one of the pastoral qualifications was that a man be the husband of one wife. How could that be a qualification for eldership or pastoral responsibility if at the same time uh, priests were being manda mandated to uh, not take a wife? Uh, of course, the, the fruit of this in the corrupt Catholic system was that nobody got married, but they still had illicit relationships and fostered illegitimate children and all of that. So Luther said nonsense to all of that, and Luther gets married. And his wife, Katrina, or Catherine, Katie, as she is often referred to, Katie von Bora, uh, she was a nun, as was mentioned earlier. Luther actually helped her and her fellow nuns escape by hiding them in fish barrels, herring barrels, and uh, transporting them out of the nunnery. And so here we have a former monk who was supposed to be celibate his whole life, and a former nun who was married to the church. Uh, now getting married, God brings them together. It was not love at first sight. In fact, Luther was not convinced that he wanted to get married at all. And uh, it was only later that through a series of circumstances, uh, he and Katie got married. I actually like what he wrote in 1524. He had a good reason for writing this, but I think it's kind of funny because it reminds me of some seminary students who are convinced that they're going to be bachelors to the rapture. But he wrote this, I shall never take a wife as I feel at present. Not that I am insensible to my flesh or sex, for I am neither wood nor stone, a reference to his gender there, but my mind is averse to wedlock, 
because I daily expect the death of a heretic. So he thought he was going to die at any point, and so he didn't want to get married because he didn't want to leave a widow. That, that's a pretty good reason. Um, the reasons I hear from some single seminary students are not nearly that good. But I think it's kind of funny that he's, he has this great statement of, I'm going to remain single, and then within a year he's married. So it's kind of fun how the Lord works through human plans and his own providence. Uh, Luther and Katie's marriage was a great marriage. It was a great friendship. Uh, Luther, uh, Katie Luther, Katie was a very strong personality. You would have to be a strong personality to spend your life with a guy as outspoken and demonstrative as Martin was. And uh, she essentially run, ran almost a hotel there in Wittenberg. They actually took the old, uh, the old kind of student quarters for some of the monks, kind of a dormitory for monks. They actually took that, and since Catholicism was out, Luther made this almost hostel his house. So it's this big building, and uh, Katie was the one who, in very much a Proverbs 31 fashion, ran all of the domestic responsibilities of the, of the house. Uh, so she had guests all the time coming through there. The Luthers had six children of their own, and uh, she was the one out uh, helping with all of the farming. She would buy land, all that kind of stuff. Everything domestic, really, she took care of. In fact, Luther has a statement where he essentially says, in things domestic, I leave it all to Katie, otherwise I leave it to the Holy Spirit. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's God and my wife, and uh, those are the two... Um, authorities in my life, uh, obviously uh, recognizing uh, the way in which Luther intended that. He greatly loved his wife. He often called her his rib. He would write letters to her, dear rib. In fact, he has some really funny letters. Luther was highly sarcastic. Even at the end of his life, you can go online and check out his letters. He wrote a letter to his wife about a week before he died, where he was joking with her that she was worrying too much about his health which obviously she was justified in that because he didn't live much longer. But he wrote this funny letter where he was like, just today I walked out of my room and a stone fell on me and crushed me. And then I, you know, and he has all these scenarios of the bad things that happened to her, joking with her that, look, your anxiety is warranted because look at all these bad things that happened to me because you were worrying about them. So they just had kind of that fun uh, give and take kind of relationship where these two co-laborers for the gospel were shoulder to shoulder in the work, and Luther would never have been able to accomplish or contribute nearly as much as he did if it were not for his wife. So one of the, you know, one of the great emphases that often is overlooked in a study of church history is the wonderful contribution of godly mothers and godly wives, and uh, a book that came out not too long ago called Feminine Threads, traces some of that throughout church history. If you're interested in getting something like that for yourself or for your wife, it's a great compilation of the contributions that women have made to the history of the church. You know, I think of Augustine's mom who prayed for him, and um, we could certainly name many, many other faithful mothers and wives whom God used to free up their husbands for the work of ministry. And uh, I, it's a point I don't want to overlook because I want to... I want to stress in your own mind, uh, those of you who are married, what a gift it is to you from God for your ministry, uh, your marriage, and uh, you should never ever take it for granted, and you should never ever allow the responsibility of ministry to overshadow the responsibility and priority that you have to your marriage, I believe, first and foremost after your commitment to God himself. So... Um, I just want to make that point. Uh, here she is, Catherine von Bora, a painting of her and then a statue of her. And uh, she used to get up every morning around 4.30 in the morning before everybody else to start getting things ready for the day. Luther affectionately called her the morning star of Wittenberg because she got up before dawn to get all these things going. So just their, their relationship was is really neat because you see that kind of joyful teasing and banter that is indicative of two people who really deeply love each other because they deeply love the Lord. There's Luther's house. Um, 
So it's not like he, you know, was this televangelist who built himself a huge house. He just took over an abandoned Roman Catholic building and turned it into a essentially an, a hotel where travelers could stay when they came to Wittenberg. And his poor wife had to care for that huge building. And uh, you can appreciate the fact that it was an awful lot of work. That's the front door. And it looks like something out of a... Um, a hair salon? I don't know. It looks like per perm machines, but I don't know what was going on there. Pictures from inside. It's now a museum, of course. And um, I have a picture a little bit later of Luther's table where students would record the things that were said, and out of that came Luther's famous Table Talks, which, of course, is the name that Ligonier borrowed for their magazine, Table Talk Magazine. All right, in 1525... These radical Anabaptists stirred up the peasants, and we have what is called the Peasants' War, which was this attempt to make the Reformation something of a political revolution, which is nothing that Luther ever wanted it to be. And so Luther writes against those who would take up arms to try and overthrow the aristocracy or try and produce some sort of political revolution. And here's what he says in his pamphlet against the murderous, thieving hordes of peasants. So this is not going to be good for the peasants. Um, he says this, look, the government has the right to bear the sword. Therefore, the government has the right to put down an illegal revolution. So let everyone who can smite, slay, stab secretly or openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful or devilish than a rebel. So if you're an authority figure, put down the revolution by force, the rebellion by force, even if it means you have to kill people. That's Luther's take on it. For baptism does not make men free in body and property, but in soul. And the gospel does not make goods common, a reference to communism, to Thomas Mutzer, except in the case of those who of their own free will do what the apostles and disciples did in Acts 4. They did not demand, as do our insane peasants in their raging, that the, good of, the goods of others, of Pilate or Herod, should be in common, but only their own goods. Our peasants, however, want to make the goods of other men common and keep their own for themselves. Fine Christians they are. I think there is not a devil left in hell. They have all gone into the peasants. Their raving has gone beyond all measure. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, Luther used the devil a lot as a literary device. I think you can tell. Um, not so much, I think, indicative of his true angelology, but uh, certainly an effective metaphorical device. In 1527, Luther experienced some significant physical ailments. He actually, remember, he had spent those 10 years, six years in the monastery there in Erfurt, and then his time uh, specifically in Wittenberg, but he had spent 10 years as a monk trying to earn God's favor really destroying his health in an attempt to earn his salvation. And he would experience the effects of that for the rest of his life. In 1527, those physical ailments flared up to the point where he thought he was going to die. And we also have the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, hitting Wittenberg in that same time period. The, the Bubonic Plague, of course, has a history in Europe that goes all the way back to the time of Justinian. Um, and... Uh, we're not going to get into the whole history of that, but it sweeps through these parts of Europe even during the Reformation. Zwingli will experience the Black Plague. And even during the Puritan time in England, the plague hits England and uh, many are killed. And the, um, the pastors and the doctors, because they were more wealthy, uh, along I suppose with the, the lawyers, the, the wealthier members of the middle class, they're always the first ones to leave whenever the plague hits. And these Protestant pastors are the ones who stay and minister to people and uh, are a great witness for the gospel in the midst of all of the suffering and death. In a letter to Melanchthon, Luther expresses his physical trials and spiritual despair to the point where he says he almost abandoned his faith. I mean, it was that bad. In some of the Psalms you, you read from Asaph or from David or from the sons of Korah and these men are crying out for God where are you 
uh, Luther experienced those same emotions. But when he came out of that time, that was when he wrote his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He had prayed the prayer before the Diet of Worms. He had actually been kidnapped and taken to a mighty fortress in the Wartburg Castle. And now, emotionally and spiritually, he goes through a time where he thinks his faith will be lost. And when he comes out the other side and his faith is not lost, perseverance of the saints, of course, we understand why, he recognizes that it's only because God's strength helped him endure, and he writes really the most famous hymn that's ever been written, at least in Protestant history. Um, maybe not the most famous hymn in English. This hymn has been translated into many languages. I would think Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, is probably the most famous hymn in English, but A Mighty Fortress is Our God would be a close second. That hymn comes out of the personal turmoil and angst of his own spiritual devotion to Christ. I think that's helpful because the words are so familiar that sometimes we take them for granted and uh, to recognize the raw emotion that was part of the composition of that hymn helps us appreciate what was being sung.